Hello and welcome to another Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. This week, uh, amazing networking, networking security, IP tables discussion by Carl Perry. Um, it's amazing and it's great. And at the end of it, I put our prep conversation, which is all about space. So if you're a space nerd, stay tuned for that because we talk all about rockets um, 45 minutes into the video. So enjoy that too. Ciao. Uh, so with without further ado, I'm going to turn us over to the topic of, of hand, as much as I love the, the space exploration piece. And, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, we were talking, we were having an internal meeting, uh, and we talked about IP tables and the challenges of IP tables, and Carl uh, came up with a whole bunch of interesting information that just made my head explode around NF tables and things like that. And I'm like, all right, I, I'm going to need time to digest it. So I asked Carl to come uh, out and, and talk uh, to the group about what, what we need to know about uh, IP tables or what we should forget, I guess, about IP tables, Carl. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, I so will, if you uh, want, go ahead. Yeah, let me, let me, let me share it. It'll make life a little bit easier. I put together awesome. slides. Thanks. Um, and uh, excuse my use of uh, Edge because you know it's it's better than Chrome for me. Um, <laughs> so yes, let's talk about NF tables. Um, it's the Linux firewall of today, whereas most of the time it's been the Linux firewall of tomorrow. Um, so hi, I'm Carl. Um, I I do. Linux stuff, network stuff, care about operations. Uh, I am EDOLNX on most social media platforms. Be aware if you follow me on Instagram, you're gonna get lots of pictures of Amiga hardware, but otherwise it's fairly <laughs> fine. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, NF tables and IP tables and firewalling in Linux. And so first, let's talk about the dark times. Um, in the beginning, <laughs> There were many different things before Linux, uh, and there was a consensus of moving towards this thing called PF, or packet filter, in most of the BSD world. And this also included the BSD variants like uh, Solaris and thing, or at the, that point it was SunOS, it wasn't even Solaris and things like that. Um, for a time, there were several wildly incomplete, wildly incompatible firewall implementations in Linux. One of them was PF. Um, and for a brief period there, we thought it was going to be this wonderful world where PF would work on everything. Um, and then Linux moved on. And starting in Linux 1.2, we got IP chains. Um, IP chains was the first of the firewalls that actually worked. And it had the one killer app that PF didn't at the time, which was masquerading. Um, or it is more commonly known, uh, SourceNet. And this allowed you to do the things that we are still paying for today uh, in the late 90s of using RFC 1918 address space on your local network and having that NAT to an actual IP address on the internet so that your ISP would only have to give you one IP for your entire six million person organization. Um, which is fine and dandy um, and it was a way to get around the problem. The, the actual solution to this was IPv6, we'll get there. But it was missing some key features. The biggest one was it didn't work with bridges. It didn't work with IPv6. And so this other project started up called Traffic Control. And Traffic Control was added to the kernel around the same time to shore up some of those edges. And there was one killer app that went into TC, um, which we'll get to in a minute. The big thing that TC did is that if you thought IP tables and IP chains was hard, you never got a chance to play with TC and consider yourself lucky. Um, TC was written by people who understood this stuff so well. It was incredibly flexible, but it was literally like you're programming in bit slice operations at the kernel level. Like it was unbelievably user unfriendly, <laughs> but it supported things that you couldn't otherwise do. And so in about Linux 1.8, the stuff that people needed to do on a regular basis with TC kind of got brought up into two different pieces of software, IP Route 2 and uh, IP Tables. IP Tables started its life as IP Tables, but eventually grew to also be EB Tables, IP6 Tables, ARP Tables, and a few other odds and ends. And 
if you're saying to yourself, well, th that kind of sounds like that there are completely independent code bases inside the kernel and they share a lot of common features and you are absolutely correct. Um, it is a nightmare to maintain because it is essentially there are four different IP table stacks inside the kernel. Um, some of the stuff that was in TC got better um, user interface and moved into IP route two. The biggest one being IP sets and IP namespaces. Um, if you're not familiar with IP route two, uh, when you install a modern Linux distribution and you type in if config and it says command not found, that's because you haven't migrated to IP route two yet. Um, that is the IP command, which replaces uh, if config and a few others, the SS command, which replaces netstat, uh, and a few other pieces of tech. If you have not had a chance to go look at that, and I will be happy to answer questions about it, I highly recommend it because you get a lot more flexibility and control with IP Route 2 than you did with the old if config stuff because that was from the old days and the before times, even pre-Linux, where the idea of having multiple routing tables, um, having networking speeds that were faster than a gigabit were just basically completely unthought of. That's how old it is. Um, so there's still some TC stuff around in the IP tables days, but the big IP set stuff, which is super critical, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, got upgraded to, to the IP route two stuff. And then we have these four different implementations of IP tables in the kernel, um, which is to say the past was a hot mess. Um, and so a few years ago, a bunch of people who use this stuff on a regular basis decided to not recreate the sins of the past. And one of the first things that they did is they went and talked to large hosting providers, um, CDNs, hosters, stuff like that, who do a lot of networking and said, what are your pain points? And out of that came, and also to the kernel developers to say, how can we make this better? And what came of that was NF tables. So from the NF tables wiki with certain adjustments, and I will explain those adjustments in a moment, is that NF tables is the new packet classification framework that replaces all of the IP tables crap in the kernel. Now, the reason I say is, is because if you actually go look at the wiki, it says hopes to crossed out and the word is next to it. Major things have happened in the last two years that have actually pushed this over the edge of solving a lot of problems. It started as a side-by-side -side thing, but as we will talk about, Stuff has moved on dramatically, and at this point, IP tables is being deprecated. So, in a nutshell, it's been available since Linux 3.13, which means it's basically in all current distributions, CentOS 7 users, I'm very sorry. Um, it comes with a new CLI tool, which usually makes everybody groan. Just relax, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, it has a compatibility layer with IP tables, which is huge and something that no other tool prior to it for doing network notification stuff in the kernel space has had. And it provides infrastructure for constructing maps and concatenation, which replaces all of the stuff that we needed from TC. Um, so what does it look like? And here I have a screenshot from my production NF tables firewall uh, that is running. And at first you're going to look at this and go, oh my God, this looks, actually, let me flip the slides. Oh my God, this looks nothing like IP tables. And you're right, you are absolutely right. And that's okay, it's better in almost every way. Also, there's IP tables, NFT, we'll get there. So let me walk through this a little bit. If you are used to networking on big stuff, Juniper, Cisco's, things like that, the syntax is a lot closer to that than to the stuff that was made up for the Linux kernel. So in here, I'm basically saying um, IPv6 address, if it sources with this address and it has an IPv6 destination of this net block, put a counter on this rule and accept it. And you're like, put a counter on this rule, what does that do? Well, this is one of the ways that it is better than IP tables. Um, with NF tables, you can put counters on all of your rules. And you can also have the kernel show you the entire table with the current counts on those counters. So you can see if the rules that you have written are being hit by traffic or not. You can also do logging, which is something that was added later in IP tables, but it's native, native inside of NF tables. So this looks a lot closer to what the rest of the world is seeing. There's obviously still some weird stuff, like this is in a, 
I'm not going to call it JSON-ish format, but it's, you know, it's, it's obviously got some specialties in it. You have this weird type hook output priority thing for setting up the actual table, but that's kind of boilerplate. The actual rules look a lot cleaner to what you see in the rest of the networking world than you have previously. So let's talk about how much it's better. There's way better performance in throughput. Uh, about 10 years ago, I worked at a large hosting company. Um, we used IP tables on our production servers. Um, but at one point, one of the engineers decided to use a connection tracking rule on those servers. Now, again, this was 10 years ago, but let me set the stage. So this is a quad core AMD Opteron processor with a 100 megabit NIC plugged into it because yeah, um, and that quad core processor, each one of those cores ran at about, I want to say 1.8 gigahertz. Um, if we turned on, just loaded the IP tables connection tracking tool, that machine would go to 100% CPU utilization entirely with kernel tasks, just trying to keep up with 100 meg of networking. It was bad. Um, work was done to reduce that load by quite a bit. And because of that, I, in most hosters environments, we would actually put the connection tracking modules for IP tables uh, in the kernel module block list. Um, I obviously am a bit of a fan of PF. Um, as was mentioned earlier, PF is cool. And so when I was building larger scale firewalls and routers here, both for my stuff and for production environments that I use, I would use FreeBSD and PF to do that. And it wasn't until about 3.13 that I started looking at IP tables because this solved a lot of the performance problems. PF on FreeBSD 10 and 11 could handle a one gigabit link on a one gigahertz core pretty easily. IP tables could not. Um, that same hardware running kernel 3.14 with an early release of NS tables my CPU utilization on my one gigabit link here at home went from about 85% of my system to beneath 30% of the system, just dealing with the connection tracking stuff, um, which is awesome. The next major thing is that it's got native support for large IP sets. And you're like, what the heck is a large IP set? I have never heard of this before. This is one of the things that is huge for hosters and CDNs. I know of at least two CDNs that use IP sets in their production database on their, on their production systems for Linux to create block lists for DDoSs. And how those work is that you wind up loading thousands of net masks. Uh, there is one that I use on my um, BitTorrent client, which of course I only use for distributing Linux ISOs. Um, that has a block list in it. That block list has 37,000-ish entries on a given day of abusive users and various other things. Um, loading that into IP tables would cause your system throughput to drop to less than about 10 megasec. Using the IP set stuff that came out of traffic control, you could put ridiculously large lists in um, and manage it that way. This supersedes that and makes it even better. Um, so I know, like I said, a large CDN is using this because that's how they do their block lists for DDoS and for known bad actors on the network. They literally have their Linux front end servers plugged into core routers of the internet. They are accepting all of the routes from the core routers going into the Linux routing table, like the complete internet routing table into a Linux routing table, and then using IP set blocks to do traffic control. Um, and with NF tables, it works. It did not work well prior to that. Um, and then the other thing that's super nice is that it's one control for everything. Uh, NF tables is the NF tables implementation full stop. It supports bridges, it supports IPv6, it supports IPv4, it supports ARP. You can do stuff with network discovery, or excuse me, neighbor discovery, which is a key part of IPv6. It replaces ARP and a bunch of other things, um, all in the same place. It's one code base as opposed to what was in the kernel before with IP tables being four plus code bases of mostly duplicated code. Um, how does all of this magic work? Is it implements an in-kernel just-in-time virtual machine. So 
when you write your NF table rules or use the NF tables command line to add or manipulate rules in the system, one, that's all done atomically, unlike before, which is great. And two, it compiles down into bytecode that runs in an in-kernel virtual machine, much like another networking product, which we will get to. Um, those rules do allow you to make all those changes atomically and are super, super fast, which is part of the reason why it can do as much as it did before. It does have some accommodations for um, large network blocks and uh, large network lists and things like that. But for the most part, it's fast, it's expedient, and it's only gotten faster since it was originally implemented. Um, when can I use it? And the answer for the most part is now. Um, there's a couple, a couple notes in here. Uh, the first one is Ubuntu since 1604. 1604 shipped with a 3.13 kernel, so it works. Uh, uh, 1404 also shipped, excuse me, 1404 shipped with a 3.13 kernel, but it didn't ship with the user space tools. 1604 has a newer kernel, it works. Later versions have started the migration to using NF tables instead of IP tables, but LXD and snaps are still problematic and Ubuntu is considering rolling back and we're all yelling at them for that. So we'll see what happens there. Um, CentOS 8 and RHEL since 8. Um, sorry, 7 shipped with the 3.10 kernel. There's, there's only so much you can do. If you use one of the backported kernels, it works just fine. Uh, and there are several hardware enablement kernels that work. Debian since 9, uh, Alpine since 3.2, Arch, of course, uh, and if you're doing Linux from scratch, uh, you need at least a 3.13 kernel. Performance gets better the later you get. I highly recommend 5.7. Um, so how do you migrate from your IP table stuff to your NF table stuff? And the answer to that is this wonderful thing called IP tables hyphen NFT. In most distributions today, when you apt install yum install, dnf install, IP tables, what you're actually getting is IP tables NFT, unless you specifically say you want IP tables hyphen legacy. IP tables NFT gives you the exact same IP tables interface that you are used to. All the same commands work the whole nine yards, but on the back end, it sends it to the kernel as NF tables commands. So if you have the IP tables NFT installed on your system, then all of your existing IP tables save, IP tables restore stuff is gonna work because it's essentially transparent. And this is well maintained and well tested. And yes, um, it's the next slide, but it does work with Docker. It is one of the largest use cases is, can we make sure that everything that we are trying to do functions with Docker? Uh, there's a lot of testing that's done to make sure that the stuff that Docker is doing for port forwarding, network address translation on both the source and the destination side, all functions correctly with NFT. You just have to have IP tables NFT installed because Docker has not migrated to native NF tables yet. But let's say you have a bunch of stuff installed. How do you want to do this? First thing, run IP table save. Store your firewall rules like you're used to, no problem. Upgrade to the IP tables NFT package. You're good to go. My next suggestion would be to add IP tables, EP tables, and IP6 tables to your kernel module block list. And then at that point, reboot, which seems weird. <laughs> but the reason why I say that is because um, IP tables has a lot, a lot of kernel modules. Uh, the last time I counted, there were 45 and, or more various tables from all the different implementations of IP tables, IP6 tables, EB tables, and there's protocol helpers for each one of those. All of that stuff has been rolled over to NF tables and most of it is done in that JIT VM now, as opposed to having a requiring a kernel module, which is great. Um, but the easiest way to ensure you don't have any of that stuff left behind is to just do this. I highly encourage adding IP tables, EB tables, and IP6 tables to your kernel module block list no matter what, because if you install something like Docker or PryTunnel or a piece of software that hasn't completely done the migration to NF tables yet, it's common that they will just mod probe IP tables for you and then you have two firewall systems running at the same time and it's bad. <laughs> so putting that on the block list will make it so that doesn't happen and you don't have to sit there and go, why am I suddenly dropping traffic all over the place? And that is because you're running two firewall systems. Um, so the next question becomes, how do I know this isn't another flash in the pan? Uh, there have been 
things in the past where Linux has tried to move on from different networking technologies. I mentioned the, the past with PF where we all thought that was going to be great and then we went in a completely different direction. Uh, and the answer to that is it's already the default in most distributions and it's going to, the IP table stuff is actually being deprecated at this point. So Debian and Fedora are making NF tables the default in the re next release. They prefer them now. And at IP tables, uh, legacy is actually listed as deprecated in both implementations. But Debian 11 is not going to support IP tables at all. And Fedora 33 is deprecating IP tables for NF tables by default. And because of that, so will CentOS and RHEL 9. This works, this is, the IP table stuff is listed as deprecated in Red Hat and CentOS 8 as well. The NF tables are, stuff already exists. Um, Firewall D, which is what does most of the firewall management across platforms, has already stated that they are moving to NF tables by their next major release. Um, they've been using the compatibility layer stuff, but now they're ripping out all their IP tables code and they're just doing the NF table stuff, talking straight to the kernel, which is great. Uh, and the last one is the IP tables code has a death clock. The kernel development team and the network development team specifically, that code is duplicated, as I said, four plus times in the kernel. They want it out of there. They have not put a date on it yet, but it's coming. Um, and so that's going to make life a heck of a lot better because we have one firewall, there's one touch point in the drivers, there's one touch point in the stack, and there's one code base to maintain all of this. And it's actually a lot easier to read and understand than the older IP table stuff. Which now brings us to the next question of what about eBPF? The solution to every problem that has ever existed in the last 20 years is an eBPF. Um, and the answer to that is, well, sort of. eBPF is great, but it is not the answer to everything. Um, and the biggest one here is eBPF has a program size limit. It does the same thing that NF tables does. It runs as an in-kernel virtual machine with a just-in-time compiler. Um, it's awesome, but your maximum program size for eBPF is 4K, data included. It has to fit in a single kernel page. You can't store a lot of IP addresses in 4K. You can store even less networks in 4K because that's really two IP addresses, one 32-bit IP address or one 64-bit, excuse me, 128-bit IP address and one net mask of the same size. So, in a 4K page, if you were just storing IP addresses, you're talking about 500-ish IPv4 addresses and around 150 IPv6 networks, which is not great. And this is part of the reason why NF Tables is not currently using the eBPF stuff. There was a plan to try and make an eBPF implementation of a replacement for IP Tables called eBPF Tables. Um, but that seems to have died on the vine. Uh, the NF tables team is aware of it. They've taken a lot of the optimizations out and put it in there. There has been some talk of trying to merge the NF tables, JIT VM and the eBPF JIT VM. But the thing that has been holding it back is the need for that IP set stuff. And that's probably what's going to prevent it from happening in the meantime. But two, in kernel JIT VMs is better than 20. <laughs> so for the most part, everybody seems pretty happy about it for now. Um, so like I said, it's not eBPF, it's close, and there's reasons why they're not using it. There, that does not preclude things from changing in eBPF in the future to be able to actually have read-only data pages that you can reference from your eBPF program to support larger data sets in the future. But right now, this is why it isn't the eBPF it may go that way in the future. Um, some resources for more information. I did not get into details of the actual implementation, the command line syntax, the file format, all of that jazz. There is some great documentation online. The NF tables uh, wiki has a lot of fantastic stuff in it. Um, if you're looking for a great place to get started because you have absolutely no idea where to begin, the Arch Linux wiki is amazing and their NF tables uh, page is of no exception. Um, there's a tremendous amount of reference information on the NF tables wiki site. It is actively maintained by the developers and kept up to date and is basically the canonical source of documentation. Um, pretty straightforward to get started and to dive into
uh, more complex stuff if you need it. But both of them, uh, both of those links have great examples for simple to moderately advanced stuff of like, you know, hey, I want to do NAT. I want to replace my Linksys router with something running NF tables. How do I do that? It can walk you through the whole thing. Um, and that is mostly what I had. I wanted to leave time for questions, if anybody has any. Hey, Carl. Shane. Hey, Shane. Oh, so ahead. question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Has anyone implemented sort of a clean API interface to NF tables? It's one of the things that's always been frustrating about a lot of these other tools is they're command line driven. Mm -hmm and trying to implement them in distributed architectures and you know many machines across many clouds etc is a serious pain in the ass to coordinate and manage and yes. putting an api in front of tooling like this obviously has significant security implications but makes that process much easier to automate so there's a couple things that you can do that you could not do with IP tables to help with that. Um, the actual implementation of the command line tools talking to the kernel is through Netlink. So you can build your own Netlink uh, API interface to the kernel to put in NF tables commands. They're well documented. That is considered a public API. It is not like the IP table stuff that was doing weird magic. Um, if you don't want to do that, however, there is some cool stuff that you can do. So um, by default, NF, the NF tables command, the NFT command line tool will read a config file. It is typically etsy nftables.conf. It supports inclusion of other files. You can actually just say, I want to pull in another file here, there, and everywhere. You can distribute those files through your configuration management tool of choice and have them get pulled in and reloaded on demand. Unlike IP tables, NF tables updates are atomic. So if you make a change to one of the included files, it will know what the difference is and just make that change in the actual JIT in the kernel as opposed to reloading everything. So you can make rules changes on the fly without dropping all of your connections like you had to do with IP tables before. That's kind of the only way that I would recommend doing it right now, but that is one method other than writing your own interface. Hmm, okay. That in itself is, Thank a, you. is a big deal, right? Because yep. resetting all your connections yeah, to huge deal. change. It's a big deal. Is, wasn't like that something the old like the DHCP those? servers. <laughs> That was that was a big driver for us when we when we had to write our own DHCP was the atomic update. Wasn't that one of the things that made a lot of these Linux based firewalls problematic? Is that yes. anytime you would change the configuration of not of a switch, sorry, Linux firewalls and Linux switches. If it, you were it, using connection tracking, yes. If you weren't using connection tracking, it wasn't so bad. But most if you wanted to use source or destination NAT, you needed to have connection tracking turned on. Um, which was unfortunate because there are ways of doing that that don't require connection tracking, but the implementation was a little naive and didn't support that. So you could do like static one-to-ones, um, but that still required to have the connection tracking modules in place, which was problematic. Um, so yes, if you had the connection tracking stuff in place and then you would go and try and make a change, yeah, it would drop the connection tracking table, which sucked. Um, that is not the case with NFT, which is great. Uh, and the entire NF tables experience is that it, it keeps track of that separately, which is awesome. Any other I'm questions? I have more questions. I'm pausing to let, like, give other people a chance to unmute and ask. Rocky, did you have some? You had some early comments. There's Definitely some stuff in chat. I'm trying to figure out how to get the chat to show up because I had it open and now it's hiding. Aha, here we go. All right. Zoom All right sucks for Let Linux, let me tell you. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm on Windows. It's not much better there either. Um, okay, so. <laughs> um, Rocky was saying, I uh, have to hold a whole new stack utility with IP route too, and you just need, a, yes, you just need NFT. Um, uh john asked probably true for cube proxy i am not sure what that was related to um but yes kube proxy should work with the ip tables nft stuff as well um 
And and then I was asking uh, on top of that with mm -hmm. the, because I know that QProxy relies on IP tables, I believe it exactly. does for some of its routing. And is that gonna, that's gonna require a rewrite from them too, right? Yeah, so basically the, the stuff that is currently using IP tables, like, like I said, the IP tables NFT team are keenly aware that Docker, Kube, all of that fun stuff are doing horrible things with network address translation <laughs> to make uh, containers work. And that is their primary use case for testing with IP tables NFTs to make sure that that stuff works. I mean, if, if we redid like something completely different than Docker and used an NFT, would that like potentially fix the container networking horror show that it is? Yes and no. Um, there's, there's still a lot going on there that there's not a good answer to. Um, I recently did a, a dig through on this to see if there was some way to, to solve some of these problems. And the, the short answer is without everything moving to IPv6, the answer is no. <laughs> there are ways to make this a hell of a lot better in IPv6, but there is no good way to solve this in IPv4. Um, there was a roadblock for a very long time in IPv6 that there was no such thing as a private network address space. Um, that has changed. Um, something like Docker can use the documentation space. And there is also uh, the, um, there was the concept of a ULA, but that got shot in the foot pretty quickly. And now there is a, uh, essentially a reserved address space uh, that is gargantuan. I want to say it's a 20 four or a 12, uh, which we're talking subnet mask size. So that basically means you have 96 bits of addressable space. It's huge. Um, available for, or greater than 96, I should say, available for uh, that sort of stuff. The idea is it is not just like the RFC 1918 stuff. Everyone agrees that if they see packets from that at their border, they drop it. Um, so that helps a bit. Um, and that space is so gargantuan that you can randomly pull a slash 64, which is the default size of an IPv6 network out of it. And the likelihood that you're going to hit somebody else is close to none. Um, but all of the tooling for Docker is written for IPv4 right now. And that carried forward into the OCI specs and various other things. So there's a lot that needs to be done to get to the point of doing um, IPv6 in containers natively. I wish we would. Um, my understanding is uh, Google is doing that. And that was the one of the concessions that was made when they open sourced Kube was to only make it v4. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that makes a lot of the uh, makes a lot of these problems go away from a network address translation state because you don't need to do it anymore in V6. Like that's the whole point. Um, and if you do need to do it, you can do it statelessly instead of statefully. Um, so yeah, the, I, like, I don't have a good answer for that right now. I know there's some people talking about it. Um, the other part of the problem is NF tables, much like, uh, like I said, NF tables use the Netlink socket the biggest problem that all of the container runtimes currently have is they're all written in Go. So they can't talk to the kernel Netlink socket directly, um, which is where a lot of the performance and startup problems of containers comes from because how that works currently is everything has to stay within the Go sandbox. And so at the last stage of a compile for run C or for um, uh, Docker or Moby, is a C library gets wedged in at the last minute of the compile, which mem copies stuff between the kernel netlink interface and the sandbox inside of Go. And it is hoped that those will not change outside of that. Spoiler alert, they do. And this is where you get failed Docker starts coming from is that that stuff gets out of sync and it doesn't know how to fix it. Um, so, because NF tables uses that same netlink interface to talk, um, it will be interesting to see uh, if future stuff and some of the new projects like uh, C run, which is a container runtime that is written in C as opposed to being written in Go, can actually talk to that, will solve some of those problems and open up doors to making life easier. 
Um, but really, a lot of the problems in the Docker space just boils down to that we're not using real NICs, we're using pseudo NICs, we're passing stuff through and we're depending on the routing table and doing multiple layers of network address translation to get stuff in and out in between containers. Um, clearing that up by using something like V6 would, would help, but it's not a snap your fingers and NFT makes everything better. It does look like Intel did a DPTK port, which would allow you to stop the context, which is mem copies for Go programs. Yeah, yeah, I, do, I don't think they can, uh, unfortunately. Well, they, no, I just Googled around. I found at least a link to it. So I was looking at that earlier because I only had the same performance problems as OVS. Um, and that was the only way of getting around it. Yeah, D DPTK is interesting. It's also it doesn't like, my beef with OVS is that OVS is great. It's the only freely available thing that is an actual honest to God switch, but it is unfortunately a flow switch and not a packet switch. And that's where it starts falling apart because most people look at internet traffic and go, okay, great. I can turn a TCP connection into two flows, a send flow and a receive flow and everything's fine. Um, but the edge case of UDP and the corner case of ICMP tend to make your flow tables overload really quickly. And that's always been the problem with trying to get performance up. DPTK can only get you so far. It's, it's rough and it's one of the things, like I remember I was involved in the OpenStack networking team for a long time. Uh, I joke for, uh, I still joke that everything that's wrong with OpenStack networking is my fault. Um, but I remember several years Be ago. Be careful what you take responsibility for. Yeah, I know. Um, several years ago, I was talking to uh, my friend John Willis uh, because he had created Socket Plane and Socket Plane was getting acquired by Docker. Um, and that had been publicly announced. And I sat down with him one evening and I was like, please tell me that you're not depending on Open vSwitch and DPTK to solve all of your problems. And he went, oh, well, what else would we do? I was like, anything else. Like, doing some of this stuff in eBPF would actually make life better for you because at that point you would be back to packets and doing rewriting of headers on that instead of managing all of the flows and the flow tables getting out of control. And he's like, we don't think it's going to be that bad. And then nothing ever happened with the packet plane, uh, the, the packet plane stuff because OVS couldn't handle the stuff that was being pushed through it. Um, it is not that OVS just needs to get better. It's my, my experience has been, it's just a, a fundamental, it's because OVS is doing everything that is flow based and fundamentally that doesn't just really jive with how we do networking currently. As stuff is getting faster and faster, we need to be able to compute flows more carefully. And that's a very processor intensive operation. How we've been able to get to 400 gig ethernet is by going, it's packets, I only need to lurk at the first 24 octets to make a decision. And I can do all of that in essentially lightly programmable hardware and that's how I can keep my speeds up. If you're trying to do all that stuff on a flow state basis, there's a lot more tracking information that needs to be done. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that at some point someone is going to take the P4 infrastructure and I do not mean Perforce. <laughs> um, P4 is a toolkit for making um, the, the same technology that happens inside of switches, the name, uh, cam tables uh, inside of switches in software using eBPF. My hope is that someone is going to start working on taking that P4 stuff and doing a software implementation so that you can essentially have a full blown learning switch inside of an eBPF kernel module, excuse me, inside of an eBPF uh, program that can reside inside of the kernel to essentially act as a software switch for plugging different virtual NICs into. But we'll see what happens. It sounds like a lot of steps. <laughs> sounds like a cool idea. I mean, the whole reason they did packets was because they didn't have much compute power way back when. Yep. And the, the networking speeds have grown exponentially while the compute power well, I run it, the compute ca power has grown, but the interconnects have not. That's been the problem. Um, yep. Intel's been stuck on PCI Express 3.0 for over a decade at this point. 
and you can't really, and Intel's answer to all problems is just throw x86 cores at it. And I remember 10 years ago when I was like, okay, here's your fancy new 40 gig NIC. It requires me to use eight CPU cores to properly service all of the interrupts coming off of that eight, off of that 40 gig NIC. I only have 10 cores in your highest end part. Where do I do my processing? <laughs> and they didn't have a good answer for me then. <laughs> AMD has kind of solved that with Epic. Um, with both increasing to PCI Express 4, which makes the interconnect better, and also giving you way more cores to manage all those interrupt, uh, all that interrupt processing, but it's still an issue. I'm sorry, I, I cut you off, Rocky. Yeah, I was just going to say that that's because uh, Intel wouldn't point you at the NVIDIA GPUs to do your processing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, also like the the uh, the comment that I made to someone and an Intel engineer got very angry with me and then he thought about it for a second and said, no, you're right, is like when the, the X710s came out, I looked at them and I was like, so what you're telling me is that you've made a 40 gig version of the Realtek 8039. And they were <laughs> like, but, but, what, no, but, well, yes, um, because it doesn't do any work. Like Intel's answer is do all the work on the CPU, don't do it on the NIC. So if you've got something like a Mellanox or a solar flare or something like that, that can do a lot of the processing on the NIC. And what you get back is essentially the data streams from the network pre-processed, as opposed to, I'm going to throw up an interrupt when my, when my receive buffer reaches 30 to 50% so that you have enough time to pull out the four meg of data that's in there before the buffer fills up, figure out what to do with it, and then <laughs> shove packets back at me. Um, it's fascinating stuff how all this works <laughs> it would eft Intel hammers yeah no, that's right. would would any of this stuff with the nfts help with offload to smart NICs or you know offload processing into the nick so yes and no um there's that capability was thought about when they were doing design for it there are ways of actually injecting streams back in um, and NF table supports that. There's no universally defined interface for that yet. And that's one of the big things that's happening in the smart NIC places. Like I know um, one manufacturer is basically just throwing a little bit of smarts on the NIC. Um, and by a little bit of smarts, I mean like, you know, the TCAM tables are now, they're, they're basically taking switch components and putting them in the NIC. So bringing in TCAM tables to do some of that work for you. Um, other people are going in the complete opposite direction of we're putting a Linux machine on the NIC. The NIC talks to the Linux machine with a bunch of ARM cores, and then that talks back to the host. So you can do processing there. You can do stuff like run OVS there. Um, but again, there's no well-defined interface that isn't proprietary to that particular implementation. I think we're going to get there. I think we have to if we want to get beyond 400 gig networking because the IRQ load will just be way too high otherwise. Um, but I don't, I don't know how that's gonna shape out yet. And at the moment, the three largest NIC manufacturers in the world are all fighting with each other and not talking to each other. So there's only so much you can do. And didn't one of them just become a graphics vendor? I, well, I, yes, but I mean, if, you, if the rumors are true, uh, that might also be ARM in the next week or two. So who knows? <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> what rumor? All right, all right. I'm I'm behind on my rumors, and then we can wrap uh, it up. Nvidia actually approached Arm, as, approached SoftBank, and said we want to buy Arm. Yep. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. Well, they need a processor. And they're about the only folks that could pull it off without there being like intense, intense uh, anti. Uh, Antitrust stuff, yeah. Yeah, antitrust stuff. Huh. I don't, I don't necessarily know if that's true. I mean, a lot of people say that Apple couldn't do it. I think Apple could. The thing that I'm most worried about with Apple switching to mm -hmm. ARM is that I, I fear that Apple switching to ARM is going to be the same problem that Apple had when they switched to PowerPC, which is they killed the PowerPC ecosystem by doing it. Um, well, it used to be ARM, and the folks I know who brought ARM to Apple the first time are now working on RISC-V. 
and that's that's the other thing. Like I am I am a big Risk Five enthusiast. I'm I'm pretty well connected in that space as well. I'm very much looking forward to getting my board that can actually run uh, Linux uh, next month. Um, but the uh, uh, the thing the thing that made it click for me that this kind of makes sense with NVIDIA buying ARM is NVIDIA sees that like the microcontroller space for ARM is basically being decimated by RISC-V. Um, the Linux mm -hmm. part of RISC-V is shaping up to be the same mess that the ARM part of Linux support was like 15 wow. years ago. And there's six of us standing in the back of the room going, let's not repeat that, please. Um, but we're mostly being ignored because everybody's making so much money on microcontrollers that they're just like, ah, it's fine. Um, but microcontrollers does not equal microprocessors. And that has always been ARM's problem. ARM thinks that if you're going to do um, the, the same processes and techniques that they used for their microcontroller space, they could also use in their micro processor space. And it turned out that wasn't true because then you've got everybody making up their own interrupt controllers and their own MMUs and things like that. And nothing is compatible between two different chipsets, even if they're running the same architecture, like it's bad. Um, we're hoping to clean up some of that in risk five, but at the same time, like the manufacturers are pushing back and like, well, we want to make our own MMU. Like that's, that's our core differentiator. And it's like, it's an MMU guys. Like it's not that, uh, okay. But yeah. So like I said, the microcontroller space is basically dying off from ARM at the moment simply because after the acquisition from SoftBank, SoftBank's answer to ARM was increase your rates. Um, and the reason why everybody was going with ARM for microcontrollers was because it was ready to go out of the box, for the most part did what they needed, but doesn't allow them to customize. RISC-V does. ARM started adding customization stuff, but you basically get like four four instructions that you could do whatever you want. All right, we'll see all right, how Cara, that works hold, out. hold on, I'm gonna stop you. We can have a whole nother session on ARM and Risk Five, and I will That's invite fine. you back for that because uh, <laughs> that is its own fun. So we will do it. Thank you. This was great. I I learned a ton, um, and uh, I, my my head's exploding. Yeah, Rob. So Rob, for the uh, Risk Five stuff, um, yeah. uh, ping me, and I can reach out to a guy at Mill Computing who's a uh, a CPU architect. The guy go ahead and, I mean, the, the schedules, the schedules on the website. So if re, you go ahead and reach out, I'd love to have somebody come in and talk about it and you know, pick a Tuesday afternoon, a Tuesday lunchtime, tell me which week it is and we'll, we'll book it in. Cool. Yeah. No, anybody's invite. Yeah, please. If you have somebody who you think would want to speak, just reach out. We'll get them on the calendar. It's casual. I'm trying to keep it easy. All right, everybody. I do need to, to wrap up and move on to my next thing. So, yep. All right. See you all later. What's the latest space news? You following the Mars launches? Uh, yeah. So, they, uh, the Atlas V is rolling out today. It may be, may be done. I don't know if it's entirely done yet. Um, okay. Bruno's pretty happy, which isn't surprising. Bruno's always happy when they use one of their rockets. Um, <laughs> so, I'm at this point, it's mostly just waiting for that. And then, um, Saturday, uh, it is entirely possible that <clears throat> the Dragon TM DM2 mission is going to come back. Um, oh, okay. That's the current game plan on oh, that. That's still up there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So it, it needs to come back because the next one goes up in like 14 days. <laughs> Another dragon? Yeah. Okay. So that's the actual crew mission one. Uh, and that's bringing four people with it as opposed to the, the two uh, that went this time. Um, and then. Um, uh, which tells you how much confidence they have in the uh, the platform because <laughs> they've, they've already scheduled it and it hasn't come back yet. But to be perfectly honest, like we've landed dragons a lot of times. It's not a big deal. So um, there's a, a lot of interesting uncertainties in that at the moment uh, with the, the storm brewing in the Atlantic. And then also they haven't officially picked a landing site yet. Oh. So the deorbit process can be anywhere from six to 30 hours, depending on which landing site they pick. Um, and sense. we won't know until they pick it, which will be after it undocks. <laughs> huh, interesting. Well, I mean, what about 
from a drone ship perspective, don't they have to get the drone ship? They have two or multiple ships? So the, it's not a drone ship. The, oh. um, the rescue operations for this one are done by manned craft. Okay. Um, and it's actually completely done by Space Force of all places. Um, so they do the, it's, it's classified as search and rescue, even though it's, okay. it's, I mean, it's recovery, but it's their search and rescue teams that do it. Um, okay. because if it goes wrong, you want the rescue teams, not the recovery teams. Okay. Um, but they have to be within a certain circumference of the, the, the landing zone in order to get there in under, I want to say it's 45 minutes. The spacecraft can sit there and float for hours. Like that's not really a problem, but that's NASA's um, thing is that you know, once it splashes down less than 45 minutes, the, um, the passengers have to be picked up and put on the ship. Um, okay. So that's kind of wild. I mean, considering their, the earlier history of, uh, you know, astronauts not, not waiting. Right. I guess there's, Hey. We get to have, uh, was it Andy? I'm trying to remember what the A was. Oh, uh, yeah, Andy. Hey, Andy. Thank you for identifying yourself uh, by email for me so I could promote you. You're welcome. Thank you for running this. Uh, that's awesome. The, uh, yeah, we're, ta we're talking space. Uh, for the lead in before Carl, Carl's a huge space enthusiast. So I always count on him for my uh, behind the scenes, what's going on uh, space stuff. It's like having my own personal YouTuber in that. Not super but behind the scenes. I could, I, I can only see so much. You only see so much, but you, you track it a lot more than I do. So why did they use the Atlas for the Mars? Is it just they need that much more thrust? The Atlas is, a, is that much bigger? So at the time when they were doing the contract, Falcon Heavy didn't exist. Um, okay. And the other part of it was uh, at the time that they were doing the contract, um, the Falcon Heavy didn't have a large enough payload capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, physical size, not weight, but physical size. They have okay. an extended... Um, nose cone now that can handle pretty much anything because the Mars rover is nothing compared to the ridiculously huge birds that the NRO puts up. And so the last Falcon Heavy launch, that's what they used on that was the extended payload fairing that lets them put up the, the birds for NRO. Um, NRO? National Reconnaissance Office. Oh, okay. Gotcha. They're the ones who put most of the satellites in orbit for reconnaissance um, as opposed to like... Uh, NGA, um, NGA is what used to be USGS. Um, they, they do uh, stuff that looks back on the planet and does, you know, like general mapping and things like that. NRO is the people who make the stuff that can like, you know, see a postage stamp from orbit. <laughs> gotcha. That's cool. That makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting because I think, you know, at, there's a part of me that's like, why replace a working platform? If they have Atlas, but I guess there's a huge cost, right? I mean, well, the biggest problem, like everything except SpaceX and Blue Origin requires Russian rocket engines, which after the invasion of Crimea a few years ago, can't be done anymore. We have a limited number of engines that we can purchase because they're all based on the RD-180. And this was because in the 80s, during the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, Congress passed legislation that said, we don't want all of these Russian rocket scientists going to the highest bidder. So if there are parts available from Russia that you can use in your rockets, you have to buy them from Russia rather than building your own. And we've done that for the last 40 years. It wasn't until SpaceX came along and said, we want to make new engines on our own, um, that it suddenly became a problem. So at the moment, I think it's 2022 is the last year that the Atlas V or the Delta IV will fly because they're out of engines. They're waiting for BE-4 engines from Blue Origin to make their next generation rocket, which ULA is taking the Delta and the Atlas and merging them together into this thing called Vulcan, and that's going to run on BE-4 engines. But their Amazon Prime delivery of those engines is about three years late. <laughs> Got it. Makes sense. I hadn't, 
that that's an interesting detail on the Russian supply chain. So, and the Atlas doesn't reuse engines, right? They're no, no. Those are those are uh, one one and done. The only ones that are doing reusable at the moment are Blue Origin and uh, SpaceX. Although Arian is trying, desperately trying, because <laughs> they want to bring their costs down. Yeah, it seems like the ability to reuse an engine would make a huge. I didn't realize that those rockets were completely not any, you know, there was no reuse. So yeah, that's a huge expense. Those are precision machines. Yeah. And it gets, it gets even worse than that because as it turns out, so like the, the engines that are on SLS are, uh, those are the, um, those are the RS 35 A's I think. Um, okay. and those are, uh, rejiggered ones from the shuttle program. So the SSMEs on the shuttle program are, okay. are rejiggered from that. Those were built by Aerojet Rocketdyne when, um, and those were derived from the F1 engines that were on the, uh, the Saturn V. That was obviously all done in the 60s and the 70s. Um, it's an heard that Rocket Giant kind of fell technology. apart after that, and yeah. they don't know how they made those engines. So Bezos actually paid to go recover one of the old F1 engines off the coast of Florida from the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> so that they could tear it apart and figure out how it was made because again, cold war. So part of the reason why all of this stuff was coming from Russia is that the Russians had the metallurgy experience with working with composites made out of titanium because they have the largest titanium deposits in the Western world um, for making the rocket engines that can exist in reflow configurations or when you're doing, um, where you're partially burning fuel to power the the, the uh, turbo jets in it to uh, not turbo jets the uh, um, turbo okay. pumps in it to make the rest of the rocket engine go. You have to partially burn the fuel to do that, which means it gets stupid hot. Um, so in order to do that, you can't just use titanium. You have to bring in other elements, and the Russians were the only ones who could do that. So even during the Cold War, the reason why Aerojet Rocketdyne doesn't know how those engines were made is that they didn't make them. The large portions of them were purchased on the black market from Russia because they were the only ones who had solved that problem and smuggled into the United States to help us complete our space program. <laughs> That's incredible. That's, I mean, it suddenly makes, I mean, you, you, you think of the rocket science as, you know, ro rocket science, but the composites and the materials and the weight, it's so precise. Um, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. That's, that's really cool. <laughs> it's a very long supply chain. <laughs> it's a very, well, it's, I mean, it's, and it, what's fascinating to me is, you know, the metallurgy, you know, I have a mechanical engineering background, and so I, you know, I understand how complex the metallurgy becomes because it's not just a chemical equation; it's treatment of that, it's composition, it can be, you know, but it's it ultimately is a molecular recipe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you didn't if you didn't know what the process was, yeah, you know, recovering an old one and then dissecting it very carefully and then reverse engineering would be part of it. And then the, the stuff that SpaceX is doing with Starship down in Boca Chica, that's a completely different engine design than what the Falcon 9s are using. So the Falcon 9s are using the tra traditional RP-1 and, and liquid oxygen. Right. Um, and that's what we've used on pretty much everything except the space shuttle. The space shuttle used um, hydrogen and oxygen as its two primary fuel sources, which is awesome because the exhaust from that is, is water. Right. Um, the downside is that was completely counteracted by the solid rocket boosters, which have absolutely obnoxious stuff coming out of the back of them. But, you know, like aluminum take, hydride or something, right? Yeah, yeah, you take the wind where you can get it. Um, so what they're trying to do for Starship is go back to oxygen hydrogen. And that requires a very different set of systems because they're doing um, a dual stage pre-burner system to charge the turbo pumps. They're extraordinarily complex and no one has done them before. The Russians have been trying for over 50 years and haven't licked it. Um, it took modern R&D into material sciences to get the metallurgy to the point where they can go, aha, 
we can actually do this while burning uh, oxygen, which is unbelievably hot to power the turbo pumps to make the rest of the engine go. Um, okay. And so that's kind of wild as well. And the reason that SpaceX is using that instead of RP-1 is because when you land on Mars, you can set up some pieces of equipment that have no moving parts that can extract hydrogen from the atmosphere and turn it into fuel. Got it, right. Yeah, the, the simplicity of the fuel is a major component for all this stuff. Yeah. There's, there's not enough oxygen on Mars either. You'd have to extract. Oh, totally. Is. You can just tear apart the carbon dioxide and get the oxygen out. That's what their plan okay, is. Because there's plenty of carbon dioxide. Okay. Lots of it. So the short supply on, on Mars is hydrogen? Oh, no, plenty of that too. Okay. Um, the short supply is just n is pure oxygen. There is a lot of CO2. There is not a lot of O2. Holy mackerel, we've got a nice crowd going. Um, we're, we're chatting about space right at the moment. Uh, in a couple of minutes, we'll turn the mic back to Carl again, uh, talk about IP tables and uh, alternate security on this. How's everybody doing? Any, any other topics before we uh, get rolling? Or qu comments or questions about space? Because we've got, uh, there, I mean, the, the, with Mars being in conjunct, what, conjunction, I think it's the right term, there's, I think, yeah. you know, we've got what, three, la we just three launches back to back on, on Mars missions. It's amazing. The, uh, yeah, I was, I, was, I was watching some of the new rover stuff and it, was, it looks pretty cool. There was one story I saw that was amazing that um, there's a a meteorite from Mars, which blows my mind, because um, I wonder how a meteor, how a chunk of Mars got back into space, but um, that they found in Egypt, I think, was in a museum and they're using it to calibrate the instruments on the rover that they're sending up. So they're sending the rock back to Mars because it's, it's, a, it's a known thing so they can <laughs> calibrate against it. That's funny. <laughs> it's a, I, mean, that, I was like, holy mackerel, I mean, literally, and it makes perfect sense. If you're going to drill into Martian rocks, right, you need a, you know, ideally a Martian rock is the, that you know is, as the calibration thing. And so, yep. um, that, that was, I, I heard that story. It was really, really cool. Did you get your name in on time to be on the, uh, uh, get, get your passport to have the name on the rover? I didn't even realize I could do it. Did you? I'm assuming you did. Yeah. Yeah, several years ago. <laughs> okay. They've been they've yeah. been running that program for a while. I don't know if they've stopped it yet or if it there's still. I don't know what the uh, the loading sequence for that is. They might be able to get a couple more names on, but you can go you can go look and see if the program's closed or not. You get this nice little Martian boarding pass as a souvenir in the whole night. <laughs> There's an arrangement of atoms in, with your name on it. Is basically the yeah yeah. That's a good that's a good promo from that perspective. I always wonder when they name the rovers, right? The, you know, it's the, it's a kid who gets the naming rights, but there's got to be you know, you know, a meaningful percentage of the pool that's making the exact same suggestion. Yeah, there's really only a limited number of names that they choose from. Nice, nice. Uh, I, I, you know, I like that Mars or not Mars. NASA knows that they're as much a PR agency as they are a science agency. Makes a lot of sense. All right, 